Grab your Bible. If you don't have one, there should be one there in the pew. Thank you, sister. I hope that's your testimony today. If not, that before we end the service, it'll be your testimony that it is well with my soul. Mark chapter 5. King Jesus' power over darkness. Your part of the message today is of what the early... One of the, one of the phrases, or the, you would, might call it a slogan, that the early believers, early church used when they saw each other. Jesus is Lord. You know, in Easter, we talk about the, one of the phrases they said, but he's risen, and then the answer would be, he's risen indeed. But another one that the early church lived, you know, Caesar was Lord in that day. <laughs> Caesar was the conqueror, was the, the, the ruler of the world at that time, the Roman Empire. But for Christians, their confession was, Jesus is Lord. So when I ask you uh, in the message today, uh, what is our confession? That's what I want your answer to be. Jesus is Lord. I'm going to actually add two more words. Jesus is Lord of all. Because he is. Someone has said, if Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. <laughs> uh, Lord means he's the Lord of all. So Jesus is Lord. Let, uh, let's stand in honor of God's word if you're able. Uh, Mark chapter 5. Verses 1 to 20. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the, the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could any one tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. He cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled and they told it in the city and in the country and they went out to see what was that had happened and then they came to Jesus and saw that the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine. And when they began to, then they began to plead with Jesus to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in the Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. May the Lord bless the public reading of his word. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for this Incident, this event in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ while he was here on earth. The God-man, King Jesus, the suffering servant King. God, speak to our hearts today. 
Thank you, Lord, for the, your word that says, as Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Remind us, God, of your sovereignty today, your authority, your power, that Jesus is Lord. Do your work in each one of our hearts and in our church today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. We're finding, aren't we, as we go through the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, one of the main themes is to reveal or to show to us the true identity of this rabbi who has shown up on the scene whose name is Jesus. To the average folk, he was just a Jewish rabbi. But over and over again, we hear the refrain in the... In, in chapter 1, verse 24, in chapter 4, verse 41, they say, who, is, who are you? Who is this man? We saw it last Sunday. Who is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. So slowly, uh, the veil is being taken off of who Jesus really is here in the Gospel of Mark. Last week, we saw that he has authority over the natural realm. He's the Lord of the storm. And today we're going to see that he has authority over the supernatural realm. He is Lord. He is the overcomer. We sang about that. He is the overcomer of the powers of darkness. He's the deliverer of those who are brought captive, the Bible says. People who don't know Jesus Christ, did you know they don't know it, but they're captive. <laughs> they're captives. <laughs> they're in the devil's prison. But Jesus, the overcomer, has come to set them free. So whether there's chaos on the outside in the storm or whether there's chaos, chaos on the inside, demoni uh, the, the demoniac here, Jesus is Lord over all. So what was the, what was the cry of early believers? Jesus is, Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord of all. But notice with me this morning the de debilitating and destructive power of darkness that is in our world. We see that in verses 1 through 5. The disciples and Jesus had uh, just got out of one storm, and no sooner than they felt the sensation of the sand uh, under their feet when they crossed over to the other side that they encountered another, what I want to call another violent storm. It was a, it was a storm of a different kind. And, uh, you know, this is the longest and most graphic and disturbing of all the exorcisms in the Bible, in the, in the Gospels. And as they disembark, they're in Gentile country. These are not Jews, especially we're going to see because <laughs> they got 2,000 two pigs. But uh, here they are. They're in, they're, they're, they're in Gentile territory. They've crossed the sea. And as they disembark, here comes a blood-stained, scarred, naked, demonized maniac running toward them. <laughs> and to really understand this passage, you have to understand what the theme of the Gospel of Mark is that we've already found out. He, Mark does not want us to be overly uh, uh, fascinated with the demonic the gospel we saw from the very first verse, the gospel of, of Mark is about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the suffering servant king, and he, he, his coming in, his breaking into history as the Savior of sinners. That's what the verse, first verse of the, of the gospel of John says. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And if we're not careful, there's, there's two equal and opposite errors into which we can fall when we think about demons and we, when we think about the demonic and we think about the devil. One is to disbelieve in the existence of the devil, and a lot of folks don't. But then the, the opposite of that is, is to believe but to feel an excessive and what I want to call unhealthy interest in the devil and in demons. What I'm really saying is do not ignore the enemy's hatred of you and his desire to, to destroy you. The devil for sure is alive and well on planet earth and his purpose is to destroy you. Don't forget that.
But let me just say, every bad thing that goes on in our world is not the devil. <laughs> uh, he, he's not behind every bush. He's not behind every backache. <laughs> we have to have balance here. Not every mental illness is demonic, and not every demon possession is mental illness. Sometimes it's actually both. But it's very complicated, and we must avoid reductionism here and say everything is the devil or there's no such thing as the devil. But notice this man here, this demoniac. He is a hopeless outcast. It says he's living in the tombs. Can you imagine living in the graveyard, folks? Here was a guy living in the tombs, uh, and he was making himself doubly unclean. In the book of Numbers, it said anybody that touched a dead body was unclean. Here was a guy who was living with the dead. He was in the tombs. This, this guy doesn't just uh, touch dead bodies. He lives there, and he's also apparently living near pigs. That's another strike against him, strike two. You see, there was no hospital for this kind of people in that day. The family, it says here, the townspeople tried to control this guy. They, they chained him up. Unfortunately, I have seen actually this in the third world in our day where people don't know what to do with a person like this and they put a chain on them. That's what they, they tried to, but, but he was so violent. He was uncontrollable. Uh, we find his name here. His name was Legion. You see, there is an un inconceivable concentration of powerful demons living in this man. The Bible says no one was able to tame him, even with chains. People treated him as an animal because that's what he was acting like. He was acting like a wild animal. Nobody wants him around. His only companions were the demons and dead men's bones in the cemetery. No one loved him, and there was no one to love. He was a total outcast. But notice, secondly, he was in bondage. He's in a bondage. Somehow, we don't, we're not told, somehow, somewhere, the forces of darkness had gained a foothold into his life, and somewhere he gave up ground to the devil, and the devil took over his life. The power of darkness puts us in bondage. But you know it happens gradually. It usually doesn't just happen at once. The, you know, the devil, the, the, the devil just sneaks up on you, doesn't he? Someone has said lust is just adultery in a little ball. Anger is just murder in a little ball. That's what anger is. You get angry? You ever get angry? Anger is just, a, it's, it's just murder in a little bitty ball. You see, that's the way the devil works. It says he was cutting himself, and it literally, it's in the imperfect tense here in the Greek, it actually indicates that he was repeatedly lacerating his body with stones. He was cutting himself. You see, God wants us whole. The devil wants to destroy us. And we see that in this man's life. God wants us to have relationships. God wants us to live in community. But the enemy works to isolate us. The enemy works to dis disintegrate us. And, and our lives and our relationships with other people. He is out to destroy your marriage. If you're married today, I want to tell you, the devil is going to try to destroy your marriage. Y'all are married, but we're going to have a, a real ceremony soon. Uh, but I want to tell you, the devil is going to try to destroy your marriage. He will do all kinds of stuff. The devil hates our souls, but he also hates our bodies, we find out here. He will have you, the devil will, he will have you uh, overly obsess over your body by constantly uh, checking your weight and how much you weigh. He, he will have you overly obsessed about your outward looks, your clothing. Uh, he, he'll disguise gluttony as comfort. Amen? 
Uh, oh me. Uh, I'd have to say oh me to that one. He thrives to tear us apart. God's trying to put us back together. But Satan, this guy is in bondage, folks. He's given a place to the devil. He's given a place to the devil. What does it tell me? Watch out for isolation. Watch, watch out for isolation. The devil will get you isolated, and then he's got you. You see, it, it, it's like he puts mirrors all around us, and, and, and we hear tapes of all of our failures, and we're horrified, and we're disgusted. And we run to things to save us, whether it's food, or, or whether it's other destructive habits, or, or, or other things. This demoniac is really an extreme case of every one of us without Jesus Christ. If you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, this is an extreme picture of really what's going on in your life. So we see the, the destructive power of the darkness. But hallelujah, folks. I love this story. We also see Christ's decisive power and authority over the darkest darkness here. Here's a hopeless outcast. He's isolated. He's unwanted. Nobody wants him. Uh, Nobody is able to help him. I'm sure folks tried to help him, but nobody is able to help him. No one wanted to help him anymore. They'd given up on him. He looks out into the sea. He looks out into the water, and there's this lone boat approaching, appearing. It, it makes its way to the shore, and from the boat emerges this, this guy by the name of Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ emerges. And you see, this story is about Christ's sovereignty his sovereign authority and the quality of, of deliverance and salvation that he brings to people. That's what this is about. And maybe you feel like today all of your efforts to walk in faith and in purity are futile. I don't know where you are today. Maybe you, you've declared yourself unclean. Maybe you've declared yourself unworthy. May, maybe... Maybe you hate yourself. The devil can get you there. And maybe you're even hurting yourself. Maybe not cutting, cutting yourself so much, but, but maybe you're hurting yourself. Or, or maybe you're living in isolation. And maybe hopelessness has, has set in to your marriage. Um, or, or, or singleness or... or, or as you think about the future. Well, I'm here to tell you this story. Be encouraged. Be encouraged this morning. <laughs> there is the Lord, Jesus Christ. What was the early church? What did they say to one another, the early believers? Jesus is Lord of all. There is the Lord. There is the Lord Jesus Christ. He has power over the darkness. That's our Savior. There is one who has arrived at the shores of our lives, and, and he has sovereign authority. He has the power of God in his hands. There's, there's one who's, who's not disgusted by our uncleanness, but who steps up on the shore to meet us. And there's one with far more grace in his heart than sin in our hearts. Hallelujah. It's Jesus. King Jesus, who calmed the stormy seas, can also calm the storm-tossed soul today. There's, there's one who is no match for the strongest of bondages. There's one who has come to destroy the works of the evil one and set the captives free. That's why Jesus came. <laughs> and folks, nothing happens until he arrives in your life. Nothing happens until he arrives. Jesus desires our deliverance far more than we want to be delivered. You think you want to be delivered today? Jesus desires it far more than you. And this demoniac sees Jesus, and what does he do? It says he runs and he falls down before him and worships him. He's full of demons, but he falls down, and what does Jesus say? Come out of him! And what happens? 
the demons know they can't stay in there anymore because the Lord has commanded them to go out. And so what do they do? This is a part I'm not sure about, folks. The demons know they cannot stay in this man. And so they start to beg Jesus to send them into a herd of swine, of pigs. And for some reason, I don't really know for sure, but Jesus agrees. You can sum up what happened here in four words. It says, he gave them permission. <laughs> and they, they left that man and they went into these 2,000 pigs. And then it says, they went out. And then they went into. And then what does it say? They rushed down. They rushed down the hill into the ocean and were drowned. He gave them permission. <laughs> they came out. They went into. And they rushed down. Why does Jesus allow this? The only explanation I have, brothers and sisters, this morning is the kingdom is here. Jesus has announced it. The kingdom is here. But it's not yet here in its fullness. Jesus hasn't died on the cross yet. Jesus hasn't paid the price for our sins yet. He, that's the only reason I can see that he allowed this to happen. The kingdom has come, but Jesus hasn't finished his work yet. But the real point that I want to leave with you this morning is not only that Jesus can deliver you, no matter whatever's going on in your life, Jesus can bring deliverance. But notice the third point. Being delivered by Jesus Christ is a call to declare his deliverance to others. Now the word spreads, doesn't it? Like wildfire of this deliverance, this destruction of these uh, 2,000 swine that drowned into the sea and the, the man whom neither chains nor men or women could restrain. And the Bible says there he is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Not naked, but he's got clothes on. And he's in his right mind. Hallelujah. And so the, the news spreads. So radical was the transformation that the townspeople says, that it says here that the townspeople were stunned. They were, they were stunned and it says they were frightened to death. Folks, this is a beautiful picture of real salvation and discipleship right here, right here. Here was a man restored. He got, Jesus restored this individual and he's sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's what it is to be a follower of Jesus. Are you sitting at his feet this morning? And at this point, we would think, wouldn't we, wouldn't we think, well, revival, Brother Jim, revival, <laughs> revival. Thousands are going to turn to Christ. Nope. Nope, that's not what happened. Remember the story here? These folks are freaking out. <laughs> that's what we would say today in 2008. They're freaking out. These people are freaking out. Folks, when you ask, when you ask for the real Jesus Christ to show up, don't think you can manage him. You can't manage Jesus. That's what we try to do in our churches. That's what we try to do in our lives sometimes. Just manage Jesus. Yeah, Jesus, you can, yeah. You can't manage Jesus. That's what they were trying to do here. You may decide you, you, you know how to, he will defeat evil in your life, but you don't. <laughs> he, he, he'll do it a different way. And so Jesus actually, he, he exposes the real demon here. What's the real demon here? We know a whole lot about it here in America. Greed. Greed. Love of the security of what we got, of our stuff, of our wealth. That was, more, that was worth more to these people than Jesus was. They begged, what, they begged Jesus to leave. They said, please leave, Jesus, please leave this place. Pigs were more important than a man's soul. You know what the folks were, fo were focusing on? These 2,000 pigs they'd lost. <laughs> their livelihood. This was their livelihood. This was, this was all of their wealth. Jesus, as I said, is unmanageable. He has something better for this guy. He's pulled him out and he's pulled him into himself to, to push him out to others. 
Jesus is saying, I bless you for you to be a blessing to others. That's what happens to this guy. I've delivered you to help deliver others. Jesus actually sends this guy out as a missionary to the very people who had rejected him. What was his mission? Just go tell your people how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on your soul. Help them to see the reality of my touch in your life. That's what Jesus is saying. Is there anyone in your life today who doesn't know the Lord has, what the Lord has done for you? Anyone in your family, anyone in your neighborhood, anyone in your community that really doesn't know what the Lord has done for you? Then I want to tell you today by hearing this message, Jesus is telling you. <laughs> you just go and tell them what, what, what I've done for you and how I've had mercy on you. That's what he did for this guy. This guy said, I want, Jesus, I want, I want to go and be with you. <laughs> he said, no, no, no. Go home and tell what God has done in your life. That's where the Lord calls us to obey him, and that's where he sends us today as his missionaries. You know your assignment, folks, <laughs> when you leave today. <laughs> I know I know mine. C.S. Lewis said, said this, that before he was uh, saved, before he was converted, here's how he described his life. A great writer, C.S. Lewis, he said this, My life was a zoo of lusts, a bedlam of ambitions, a nursery of fears, a harem of fondled hatreds. Well, the Bible describes it like this in Ephesians 2. Before we came to Christ, the Bible says we were dead. <laughs> we were dead in our sins, following the prince of the air. That's the devil. Who ruled the prince of darkness, incapable of freeing ourselves. That's what we were before we were freed by Jesus. We were lost, but the Son of God disembarked on the shores of our lives, and He saved us, and He rescued us. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Let me suggest this morning as we close our service that, that our story is even more incredible. In our story, we're going to find out at the end of the book of Mark, Jesus is treated like the demoniac. <laughs> Jesus who left, disembarked from heaven, and he ends up, we're going to find out when we get to that 15th and 16th chapter, we already know it if we know the gospel. He ends up where? Suspended between heaven and earth, naked, humiliated, crucified outside the city next to the, to the garbage dump. And he's crying out in agony saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And no one came for him. He was treated as an outcast. He was treated worse than pigs, worse than the demoniac, because he bore our sins. He absorbed the wrath of God for your sin and my sin. He was pinned down in chains so that we could be set free. He was sent to the tomb so that we could be rescued. This is our Jesus. Can you see the infinite cost that Jesus bore to defeat the evil in your life and my life out of love for us, for you, and for me? You see, it's only when we see the cost of what Jesus did that we begin to see how much He loves us. Jesus Christ loves you more than you can even imagine, folks. That's why He came to this earth and took our sins. In his love, it went deep. And now we can live in his freedom. And if his love went that deep for you and me, how, how can I not go and, and tell everyone what he's done for me? You can do that. This demoniac did it. It says he immediately went out and he just started telling everybody what God had done for him. Oh, you say, Brother Sam, my, my life's all messed up. <laughs> Join the club, folks. <laughs> I 
I challenge you to plunge your messed up life, your messed upness into the grace of Jesus Christ. We're all messed up. We're sinners saved by the grace of God. And you can be a powerful tool of redemption in the world today. Don't let the devil get you down. God wants to use you as an instrument of redemption in this world. The reason he delivered you, folks, is so that you can be a part of delivering others. And I challenge you to obey him today. Let's stand. We're going to sing uh, a hymn. Some of us may not know this song that well, but it's got a beautiful message. You stand. We're going to sing after I pray. And God is